If you've ever made ice cream at home, you know that you have to put salt in the ice. If you've tried to do it without the salt, it doesn't work. It just will not freeze no matter how much ice you put in there. We need the salt because adding salt lowers the temperature at which the ice freezes to about minus 10 degrees from zero degrees Celsius. And so what we'll see when we do our ice cream experiment next week is we'll take a bag of ice and we'll measure the temperature of the ice and as it begins to melt it's going to be zero degrees and we're going to dump some salt in the bag, shake it up, mix it around, and it's going to get colder. It's crazy. It's crazy. It gets colder. The salt lowers the freezing point, so water then freezes at minus 10 instead of zero. So freezing point depression is one of the colligative properties, and these are properties that depend on the number of particles that are dissolved in the solution. They don't depend on what the particles are, just how many particles are there. So if you have an electrolyte, the colligative property is going to be a little different than if you have a non-electrolyte. Because if you have a mole of sodium chloride, when that dissolves, it forms a mole of sodium ions and a mole of chloride ions. So you get two moles of particles. Whereas if you have a mole of sugar, you only have one mole of particles. So electrolytes give you more particles. So first we're going to look at vapor pressure. <coughs> Here we have a beaker. I'll just call this water beaker that's covered and the the water's going to evaporate. We talked about this in a previous in a previous chapter. The water's going to evaporate, and so you'll get water molecules in the gas state. They're going to bounce around here, and eventually they'll collide with the surface and recondense. And so we get a dynamic equilibrium that's established. And because we have a gas here, the gas is going to exert a pressure. And this is called the vapor pressure of this liquid. If we add a solute to the water, it's going to change the vapor pressure going to cause the vapor pressure to go down. When we add a solute here, these red spheres, the solute particles get in the way. And so, because in order for the water to evaporate, it has to get to the surface. And if some of the surface is blocked by other things, then there's not as much surface area, and it will evaporate more slowly. So evaporation will be reduced, the condensation will keep occurring, but then because that's going faster, we'll reduce the amount of gas that's present. So the effect is, after equilibrium is reestablished, now there'll be less gas above the liquid. The vapor pressure is lower than it was before, just by the addition of a solute. Anybody have any questions about that? In the Red Rover analogy, this is like you've got some bullies that are out there. They're just standing on the field and they won't get off, right? They're blocking the path. And so you can't run through the line because there are these other people standing there. It's like trying to play Red Rover in a forest or something. It's just not going to work as well. That's probably the easiest explanation to understand. But a more fundamental explanation has to do with nature's tendency towards mixing entropy. This is really trippy. You take two glasses of water and seal them up in a caked plate. Right? Looks like a cake plate. You got one that's pure water and one that's salty water. You go away, you come back, and this is going to take a while. And the level of water in the pure water beaker has gone down, and the level of water in the salty water beaker has gone up. The water has moved through the air from one beaker to the other beaker. That seems weird to me, right? It's like, how, no, how does that work? Well, that's what happens. What's going on here? 
Nature's trying to make these two solutions the same concentration. This, the salt in this beaker doesn't evaporate. It's non-volatile, so it's not going to go anywhere. The water can evaporate and condense, and so the water's going to move over here and make this less concentrated. Eventually, all the water should end up in that other beaker. We can also think of this in terms of rates of evaporation and condensation. Here we have nothing in the way for this to evaporate, and so the water evaporates. And then we've got water in the gas state all over this container, bouncing around, and it's going to recondense into both of these. But over here with this beaker, because there are solute particles blocking the evaporation, the rate of evaporation is less, the rate of condensation is the same for both beakers. And so the result is that the water moves from one beaker to the other. Of course, we have a law that quantifies the relationship of um, concentration and vapor pressure, and this is called Rolle's Law. So the vapor pressure of a solution is equal to the mole fraction of solvent present times the vapor pressure of pure solvent. So if I have a pure solvent, it's just pure water, then the mole fraction of water in the water is one, right? Because it's all water. And then the vapor pressure would equal the vapor pressure for the pure solvent. As my mole fraction for solvent goes down, the vapor pressure of the solution goes down also. So the vapor pressure is directly proportional to the amount of solvent that's in the solution. Sometimes we want to look at vapor pressure lowering. Um, delta P, the change in the vapor pressure, and that can be expressed using this variation. Delta P is the chi solute, the mole fraction of solute, times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So calculate the vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius of a solution containing 55.3 grams of ethylene glycol and 285.2 grams of water. The vapor pressure of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is 238, I'm sorry, 23.8 torr. So we're going to use Raoult's law. And so the vapor pressure of our solution is going to equal the mole fraction of the solvent. Here we've got ethylene glycol and water. Which one is the solvent? Which is there more of? There's more water, right? So the solvent's water times the vapor pressure of pure water. So we were given the vapor pressure of pure water, that zero, the degree symbol up there is signifying that that's pure water. So what we need is the mole fraction, right? We want the mole fraction of water. So the mole fraction of water in this solution is going to equal the moles of water divided by moles of water plus moles of ethylene glycol. I'm going to call it EG. So we have to calculate two mole quantities, right? So for the water, we have 285.2 grams of water. And then we're going to use the molar mass of water to find the moles of water. So that's uh, 15, we should have four sig figs, eight, two, six, eight moles. Hey Siri, what's the molar mass of ethylene glycol? The answer I found is 62.038 atomic mass units. 62.038.
That's a good question. Why did she give it to me in atomic mass units? Um, because she's not a chemist. It is the same thing. Um, she gave me the mass of one molecule, which would be in atomic mass units. What I really wanted was the mass of a mole of molecules in grams, but the number is the same. I would, I would call what she gave me the molecular weight or the molecular mass, the mass of a molecule, as opposed to the molar mass. But, you know, it's apple people. It was faster than doing the calculation myself. Eight, nine, one, eight moles. It's a nine. So this is moles of water, and this is moles of ethylene glycol. I want the mole fraction of the solvent here. So I've got 15.8. 268 divided by 15.8268 plus So this is giving me 0.94668. What are the units on that? No units. Had moles in the numerator and moles in the denominator, they cancel out. Mole fraction doesn't have units. So to find the pressure, the vapor pressure of the solution, I take my mole fraction of solvent. and multiply by the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. And we get 22.5. This solution is a little bit of ethylene glycol in a lot of water. So our mole fraction here for the water is close to one. It's mostly water. And so the vapor pressure of the solution is going to be close to that of the pure solvent, just a little bit less. Questions? So the units on the um, mole fraction? The, uh, the pressure? Yeah, so the, it doesn't matter. The, whatever units I use here, that will be the unit for the pressure I'm finding. Okay. So if I wanted this to be in atmospheres, I could convert toward atmospheres before I do it, or I could convert it afterwards. Yeah. So we were talking about something like sodium chloride in water where the sodium chloride doesn't evaporate. What if we've got something that does evaporate as our solute, like alcohol or acetone or something? Now we've got the solute evaporating and the solvent evaporating. Then things are a little bit different. So we can talk about an ideal solution. I, an ideal solution is gonna follow Raoult's law at all concentrations. It's going to follow the rules, be nice and ideal. So then the total pressure above the solution would be equal to the partial pressure or the vapor pressure of one component plus the vapor pressure of the other component. Many solutions though are non-ideal because of the interactions between the solute and the solvent.
So this is a graph of ideal behavior. Here we have the vapor pressure as a function of the mole fraction of A. So we're starting out with no A, it's all B. As we go across, we're getting more and more A and less and less B. So the vapor pressure of B is high to start with, and then it, it drops as we get less and less of it. For A, it starts at zero and goes up. And this would be the vapor pressure of pure A. And the vapor pressure of the solution is just the sum of these. If we have very strong interactions between the solute and the solvent, they really like each other. They're like really happy about being in this solution together. That causes the vapor pressure to be lower than predicted by experiment or by the equations. So A and B here are sort of clinging to each other and that causes the rate of evaporation to be lower and so the pressures are lower. So we see the vapor pressure for each component is lower and the total vapor pressure is also lower. If we've got something where we've got a weak solute-solvent interaction, they're forming a solution, but they're not real crazy about it. It's like, oh, I'm in this solution with you, but I don't really like you. I'd really like to leave. Then we find that the vapor pressures are higher than predicted because they don't like each other. Okay, this is a fun problem. Solution of benzene and toluene is 25% benzene by mass. At 25 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of pure benzene and pure toluene are 94.2 torr and 28.4 torr, respectively. Assuming ideal behavior, calculate the following. There's multiple parts. The vapor pressure of each of the solution components in the mixture. So we want the vapor pressure of toluene and the vapor pressure of benzene. So I'm going to make a little space up here. Um, so I'm going to call toluene T and benzene B. Right? So our vapor pressure for benzene, pure benzene, is 94.2 torr and the vapor pressure okay we'll go back then because I, I had a glitch here um, vapor pressure of pure benzene is 94.2 torr vapor pressure of pure toluene is 28.4 torr and I have a solution here that is 25.0% benzene by mass. That means I have 25.0 grams of benzene in 100 grams of solution. I'm trying to find the vapor pressure of benzene and the vapor pressure of toluene in the solution. So I'm going to use Raoult's law. The vapor pressure of benzene is going to equal the mole fraction of benzene times the vapor pressure of pure benzene. Well, I have the vapor pressure of pure benzene. What I need to calculate is the mole fraction of benzene. So the mole fraction of benzene is going to equal moles of benzene divided by moles of benzene plus moles of toluene. The percent by mass doesn't change if I have more or less of the solution. The mole fraction also doesn't change if I have more or less of the solution. They're both concentrations. If I look at the meaning of 25% by mass, I can say, well, I could use this 25 grams of benzene. I could convert that to moles. 25 grams of benzene. Hey Siri, what's the molar mass of benzene? The answer I found is 78.047 atomic mass units. 78.0. 0.5. I'm going to call it 0 0.5. So 25 
divided by 78.05. So this gives me 0 0.320 moles of benzene. Okay, that's great. I can plug that in here. And that goes down here as well. Now I need moles of toluene. How many grams of toluene do I have? 75. Very good. If I have 100 grams of solution and 25 grams are benzene, the rest of it has to be toluene. Right? So 100 grams minus 25 grams is 75 grams. So the rest of it is toluene. That's a little detail that a student's brain during an exam is most likely going to overlook, which then would make the problem really hard. 75 grams of toluene. Hey Siri, what's the molar mass of toluene? The answer I found is 92.06 for atomic mass units. It's just so much easier that way. So that's going to be my moles of toluene. So I'm going to stick that in here, 0 0.814468. So I'm getting a mole fraction here of 0.28. Two, two, one for the benzene. So my the vapor pressure of benzene above this solution is going to equal that mole fraction, 0 0.28221, times the vapor pressure of pure benzene. Six point six. One down. Now, the good news is we don't have to do all of that over again for toluene. I have two components, right? This is the mole fraction of one of them. The mole fractions have to add up to one. So the mole fraction for toluene is going to equal one minus the mole fraction of benzene. If I could copy it down correctly. Zero point seven one seven seven nine. So then the vapor pressure of toluene is going to equal its mole fraction times the vapor pressure of pure toluene. questions
there, there's nothing super complicated about this. I mean, we don't even have to rearrange equations, right? But there's a lot of little pieces that we have to put together in the correct way. So even though none of the individual steps is difficult, putting them all together can sometimes be rather challenging. But you can get better at it by practicing. So 26.6 tor and 20.4 tor. Cool. Um, more questions about the same situation. What's the total pressure above the solution? Thank goodness this is much easier. What's the total pressure? Well, the total pressure is going to be equal to the partial pressure of the benzene plus the partial pressure of the toluene. All we have to do is add them together. Yes. For the toluene? Yeah. Um, that was that was the answer from the previous part. Yeah. Yeah. So up here, well, it won't let me point, but those are the answers we came up with in that first calculation. So then we just have to take those and combine them, add them together. It'd be great if I could do the, all of these parts on one screen, but yeah, I barely fit part A on one screen. So 47 tor, and then part C, what's the composition of the vapor in mass percent? Oh, this is where I go like that. <laughs> want to go home and make pie we can do this we can do this okay so we're gonna to have to think about this we have the vapor pressure of benzene was 26.6 tor the vapor pressure of toluene was 20.4 tor we calculated that on the first part part a if we want the mass percent composition of the vapor. We need to know how many grams of benzene and how many grams of toluene are in the gas state. Hmm. Well, could we do something with the pressure and maybe find the moles and then use that to find the grams? We could maybe use the ideal gas law. Do we know what temperature this is? 25. We've got the pressure. The thing we don't know is the volume. But we could just choose a volume. And if we calculate the same for volume for both, then we'll get the, the moles that should be in that volume, and we can calculate the mass percent. So I think one liter would be the easiest. So we're just going to choose one liter, and we're going to do an ideal gas law problem. So does Tor work? No, it's got to be atmospheres, right? So 760 Tor, one atmosphere, 26.6. And yeah, we should go back to the unrounded ones, but it's the day before Thanksgiving. We're not going to do it. 035. It does have three sig figs, though. Atmospheres. And we're going to choose volume equals one liter. The temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. So we can take PV equals NRT and rearrange it. N equals PV over RT. The pressure is 0 
atmospheres, the volume is one liter. R is always 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin times 298 Kelvin. So 0 0.035 times 1 divided by 0 0.08206 divided by 298. 0 0.00143. 1, 2 moles. Convert that to grams. And the molar mass was 78.05. Okay, so that number times 78.05. So what I'm doing here is I'm choosing a volume of one liter so I can calculate the moles of benzene that are in one liter above this solution. I use the vapor pressure and the temperature and the ideal gas constant and I can calculate the moles of benzene and then I use the molar mass to calculate the mass of benzene. Okay, yes. You could, you could choose any volume. The reason we can do that is because we're gonna look at a concentration. The concentration doesn't change with the volume, right? But when I calculate benzene and toluene, I have to use the same volume for both. That's the only thing ever. Yeah, yep. And, and that's one of those techniques that is hard for a lot of students to get their minds around. There are some times when you just have to pick a number and do the calculation with that number because it ends up not mattering what the number was. So we're going to do the same thing here with the toluene. And this is kind of like doing multiple trials on an experiment. Do we actually have to write everything out again? Not really. I can just take this 20.4 and stick it up here. So 20.4 divided by 760. The pressure then, instead of that pressure, I've got 0 0.026842. The volume R and the temperature are the same. So I'm gonna take that number times 1 divided by 0 0.08206 divided by 298. This is going to give me 0 0.0010976 moles of toluene. And then I need to use the molar mass of toluene, which was 90 something. 90, 92.06. Zero point one zero one zero five grams of toluene. Yeah. And the reason why you didn't that is because we We're we're using the ideal gas law because we need to get the mass of these gases. And so this is one way. Um in previous semesters, I've used a different way where we use the mole fraction of the gas, um, but I think this is actually more straightforward. It's a gas. 
if you've got a gas and you've got all the information, you can use the gas law. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use the gas law, but you could. And here, the only if they didn't give me a temperature, um, then I'd I'd have a little more trouble. But they gave me the temperature, so it's cool. It, yeah, if you didn't have prior, um, pressure, you could use the mole fraction because you can get the mole fraction from the partial pressure. Um, and then detangling that into the masses of each is a separate torture. Okay. Yeah. And I'd, I'd have to do a little math to prove this to myself, but I'm pretty sure if you didn't have the temperature, if you picked a temperature and used the same temperature, I think it would come out the same. I think the temperatures would cancel out. Um, if you did it like at standard, like the meters, that's like more. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, this is never going to happen at STP because we're looking at these partial vapor pressures. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to erase the stuff at the top and put my mass percent calculation up there. So the mass percent of benzene in the vapor is going to be the mass of benzene divided by the mass of the whole thing which is the mass of the benzene plus the mass of the toluene times 100. Point one 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 seven one divided by open parentheses. Point one 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 seven one plus point one oh one oh five close parentheses times one hundred. Fifty two point five percent. And I need the ma the mass percent of toluene. There's only two things. The percentages have to add up to 100. So 100 minus 52.5. 47.5% toluene. is a bear of an example. Why is the composition of the vapor different than the composition of the solution? The solution was 25% benzene. The vapor is about half benzene. Are these compounds equally volatile, or does one evaporate more quickly than the other? We can look at their pure vapor pressures. Benzene's 94, toluene's 28. Toluene is less volatile. It doesn't evaporate as well. So even though there's more toluene in the solution, we end up with less in the vapor.